welcome everybody to um, another fascinating and wonderful event by the WGA Metro chapter. I'm Erica Silverguide, and I am extremely excited about this event. I've been putting it together for the last few months with some incredible panelists that I am honored to be able to introduce to all of you. This event is going to be recorded, and if you have any questions, Thing for the end, and we will um, we'll be sure to answer them. But the panelists today are three experts in their field, from history to cutting to the world of diamonds. And I was excited to learn more about each and every one of them. To start, we have Chris, who is currently in Germany. Um, he is extremely passionate about diamonds. He's a fellow GG from GIA, and he continued his education with rough diamonds at HDR in Antwerp, where he found many friends and a passion for diamonds. Um, he now works alongside his family in, the jewelry, in a jewelry company, and he has a massive love for diamonds. He's a history buff and has a lot of awesome stories to share with us about some of the most well-known diamonds that I think we've all read in newspapers and magazines. Um, and he's gonna share some of those stories with us today. He's married and has two children and they are currently living in Munich. Welcome, Chris. Um, second, we have Mike Asher. Mike Asher began his career at the Royal Royal Asher in 1998, training as a diamond cutter and polisher during his early years in the family business. Mike qualified as a diamond grader at HDR. He then went on to study at the world famous Gemological Institute of America at GIA Carlsbad and became a graduate gemologist. Um, working his way through the business alongside his father, Edward, and uncle, Joe. Mike became a diamond buyer, quality controller, and head production manager. Um, sorry, my computer is taking time. Uh, and head production manager, sorry about that, becoming a manager and director. Mike now oversees new business development in Asia and Europe. He has drawn in 20 years of experience in diamonds and co-created the new patented Royal Asher Oval, Royal Asher Round, and the Cushion. He is a husband and a father of four. Welcome, Mike. Thank you. And finally, we have Prina, who is a jewelry influencer and advisor. She's currently in India and has a phenomenal following and love for jewelry and diamonds. Um, she is India's first jewelry influencer with 18 years of experience in gems and jewelry in the gems and jewelry industry. She has taken formal training from GIA, GII, and SNDI. Prina is currently involved in the GIA I use alumni India, WJA's India, and the Young Volunteers. Her experience involves advertising and curating bridal jewelry for some of the biggest jewelry companies around. Recently, Priyana has initiated the not-for-profit endeavor during the pandemic to support up-and-coming designers. We, I welcome all three of you, and we are going to get started. How's everyone doing? Well, fantastic. Thank you, Erica, for having us. Very welcome. Thank you, Erica. Thanks, so, Erica. Great to, to be back started. here. <laughs> welcome back, Mike. So to get started, we all have a massive love for diamonds. And I think when this topic came up, the three of you both had great stories and something you could each share. Um, diamonds have this long history dating all the way back to the ancient. Um, what is one of those lessons that you have learned surrounding diamonds that you've always enjoyed? Uh, Prina, would you like to start? 
So um, thanks, Erica, for having me here. Good evening, everyone. Uh, it's it's a very funny story. As you know, as a child, uh, my grandmother used to call me Kohinoor, and at that point in time, I used to I used to wonder. All I knew was Kohinoor was a diamond, and all I knew it 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 was it originated in India, but I did not know anything about the story of the Kohinoor. Uh, later, as and when I started studying jewelry, that's when I got very inquisitive and wanted to find out what Kohinoor diamond was all about. And uh, later, I got to know that, you know, originally, when it was from the Golconda mines, it was about 793 carats uh, at that point in time, which was by the Kakatiya dynasty at that point. Later, there was, there was a very interesting story that, you know, how um, the various dynasties and the emperors and the kings got the Kohino diamond. And the most interesting part is that this diamond was never sold or bought. It was always, uh, it was, it went on to different people either by, you know, when uh, they would have a war or they would uh, acquire it in some or the other way. So there's one of the most interesting stories of this, uh, of the Kohinoor is of Nader Shah of Persia and how he acquired it. So in, uh, in one of the wars, uh, when he was about to acquire the kingdom, he um, uh, he actually spoke to Muhammad Shah, who who used to have the Kohino diamond in his turban. He used to actually have it folded in that. And at that point in time, when there was a feast that was organized by uh, by Nader Shah, he told Muhammad Shah that as a friendly gesture, he would like to exchange his turban, and. With that friendly gesture, Muhammad Shah couldn't ignore it or could not say no. And this is how Nader Shah acquired the diamond. And that was, I mean, it was such a fascinating story because uh, when he acquired that and he went back to his kingdom, that's when he realized that, hey, I've actually got the Kohinoor. And uh, so another, another funny story about the Kohinoor was that the way it came now, since that uh, it is in London, the way it came to London, and before I go to before I go to that, I would like to say that there was one um, one consort of Nader Shah. He uh, he said that if a strong man were to allow four stone, if if a strong man was to throw four stones, one north, one south, one east, and one west, and a fifth stone up in the air. If the space between them were to be filled with gold, all would still not value the amount of the Kohinoor. So, I mean, that is, it's just fascinating how the Kohinoor came into existence. I think uh, there is something Mike and Chris also would like to add to this. Chris, go ahead. Oh, sure. Thank you. So. So um, uh, I think I think we're going to get to the historic diamonds part first. But you know, if if you ask, you know, what, what is so fascinating about diamonds, it is if if you look at a rough diamond, you know, especially octahedron shape, uh, how how perfectly it's formed by nature, um, and you go back in history, you know, three four thousand years, uh, you know, it was perceived always as as the tears of the gods, yeah? And this doesn't matter, you know, from which culture it came from, from the Indian culture or from the Greek culture, diamonds have been have been strong the last thousands of years, you can say. That's, that's always what fascinates me on them. Yeah, well, it is uh, funny that you say, because tears of the gods is definitely something that is, uh, um, we have been actually using for so many times within our, own history uh, of our company. Um, but what's so special about the diamonds and, and, and I'm gonna give it back to you, Chris, because um, it, is, it is for everybody uh, um, in every different culture, it has the exact same symbolism and that's uh, the, the symbol of eternal love. Um, and I think that Chris, you uh, wanted to share something about that historical part specifically um, that that makes it so fascinating. And I think it also had to do something with your background. Well, it, it does a little. So, so um, uh, uh, ch just that everyone knows, uh, uh, we, I come from a classic retail background. We have a family business here in Munich, Germany, and, and another store as well. 
and uh, uh, Prena and Mike, we actually also physically know each other. We're part of a group called the Young Diamond Tears. So if, if anyone is under the age of 45 and is active in the diamond industry, uh, we, are, we, are, we are the ones uh, that, that, that make up this group as well. And uh, the, the month story Mike meant is because um, what, what, what also, I don't know if Mike and Prena even know this, but I, uh, in college, I was a, uh, a professional tour guide. Yeah, I was young and I needed the money. So I started out giving historic tours to all the castles around us in, in Bavaria. And this is where I picked up all my love and my knowledge. And one, one, one story that really got to me was, especially in the jewelry industry, is the diamond engagement ring. Yeah, so if anyone's familiar with the engagement rings, they have been around since Roman times, even longer in Celtic cultures, dating back, you know, Roman times, 2000 years. But the first diamond engagement ring uh, wasn't until 1477. This was when uh, Maximilian of Habsburg gave his uh, future wife, Mary of Burgundy, a diamond engagement ring. Yeah, so this was, this is basically the first engagement ring picture. And as you can see, <laughs> There it is, the very first engagement ring. Now, the, the special thing why I'm also telling this story is because um, uh, the Habsburgs, they were the German emperors, but they were also dirt poor. Yeah, So they needed a sponsor of uh, making this engagement ring. So it came most likely from an imperial city of the German empire. So Germany basically is not just the inventor of Mercedes-Benz and BMWs. We also did the first diamond engagement ring as well in that sense. <laughs> You guys are winning across the whole board. <laughs> That's awesome. I actually, the first engagement I knew briefly about, but I didn't actually, I didn't know all the details that you had just shared. It's, it's actually really interesting when you start going back into history and you learn all these new facts about something that we are all using every day. If it's as detailed or as that's going to show. So to dive in and, and dig deeper is, it's fascinating. And they're great selling points too, especially for clients they and customers. They're great selling points. Um, it's, a, it's, important. it's also a good story because a lot of times uh, in a negative sense, the engagement has put something down as an invention that came in the 1940s uh, by American marketing firm. But um, yeah. you know, when, you, when you have this story, you know that it goes much deeper. It's, it's, not just, it's not just a marketing story that happened in the 1940s. It's actually something that has been going on for hundreds of years, if you put it that way. The diamond engagement ring is not a new invention in that sense. It's a, it's a, it's a, it's a magical story that has been a long, uh, uh, around a long time. Absolutely. Um, so to segue into another aspect that I love, um, we have heard stories and more about diamonds throughout history. Can you, is there one that is your favorite that is about a specific diamond, legend, or tale? Chris? I think this is the Can perfect one for, for Mike to go first, uh, because as you know, Mike Asher from the Asher, uh, Asher Cut, uh, he probably can give it, us the best insight here. <laughs> well, um, you know, uh, uh, I think stories um, about the history are one thing. But um, being able to show physical product is the other. Um, so, so when you look at what I think is one of the most, or maybe the most important um, and most famous diamond in the world, uh, it is the largest rough diamond ever found, which is called the Cullinan diamond. Um, and by chance, uh, in, uh, when it was found in 1905, um, in South Africa, I have a, a, a replica in silver model right here. So this is how, how, how it was found. And it is as, I don't know if you can see it well, but it is as big as a man's fist. So, so, so when, when you see that type of product, um, when it was found, they didn't even know that uh, uh, if it was a real diamond. And it was not found by uh, normal mining. It was actually found by... Um, a security guard who, who did his last round through, uh, uh, through, the, through the shaft. And he saw something in the wall and he started to slowly dig it out. Um, and eventually he had this immense uh, rough diamond in, in his hands. And he kept it in his pocket for a couple of days, um, not knowing if it, uh, if it actually was a real diamond. And eventually he gave it to his boss and, um, uh, and it was Mr. Uh, Mr. Cullen. So the diamond was offered to King Edward VII of Great Britain um, in, uh, in 1907, actually, or 1906. 
uh, as a peace offering uh, for the Boer War, as they called it. Um, and uh, at that time, King Edward VII of Great Britain invited my, my great great grandfather, who is right there on the wall, um, uh, to see if we were interested and able uh, to cut and polish this diamond. Uh, so my great great grandfather went to uh, to 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 the king and um, and he presented the stone and and the difficulty was the stone was heavily included um, and and the DNA of our family is we cut for beauty and not for yield so uh, so he then said yeah, of course we would like to take this opportunity and 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 cut that stone um, how are you going to get that diamond from London to Amsterdam and eventually uh, the king said well we, we have a, a, a cruiser from Scotland Yard and we'll send it over and my grandfather said that's fine, put that in the newspapers and give me the stone. He gave him the stone and uh, he put the stone in one hand, in one pocket and the gun in the other and he took the normal ferry and uh, on his way home, uh, he, uh, he met an acquaintance who said, Mr. Asher, I hear the Cullinan diamond is coming to answer them. Do you know when it's arriving? And the only thing he could say was soon, I hope. And that's only the beginning because they started to uh, um, study the stone for approximately nine months, all its fault lines and irregular irregularities. And then um, after those nine months, it was February 1908. And my great great grandfather wanted to cleave the diamond. The cleaving the diamond is to break a stone right in two pieces. At that time, he decided it needed to be broken in multiple stones because it was so heavily included and that is where this comes in and uh, I'm not sure if you can see it very well but this is the original cleaving stick where of the Cullinan diamond where in this side it holds the largest rough stone and what you do is you put the stone inside and uh, you uh, uh, take another diamond and you make a small groove inside and you start, you take a, um, a, a lead pipe and, and, a, and, a, and a cleaver's blade. And after the first blade, uh, stroke, the blade broke and not the stone. So he had to create larger tools. Um, and then there is a famous story. I think most of us who have ever read something about the Cullinan is that Mr. Asher fainted after cleaving the Cullinan diamond successfully. So when I started in the business, my grandfather was still alive and I asked him, I said, what's the true story? And he said, well, he didn't faint because of the tension. He fainted because after the success of cleaving the stone, he actually drank so much champagne, then he passed out. <laughs> I, I totally understand. So what happened was he cut the stone into nine large stones and 43 smaller ones. Um, and from the nine large stones, we have a few samples, of course, which is in the original box. However, what I think is the most beautiful part of history um, is the Cullinan number one, the great star of Africa. It's a pear shape, it's 530 carats, and it's set in the imperial state scepter. And when the uh, queen, uh, Elizabeth uh, had her Diamond Jubilee, we thought, what better to create the replica from the Imperial State Crown. So this is actually the exact replica. We, it took us about a year to make it. And the guy in, there's only one guy in the, in the whole of Europe that, re, that, that actually repairs the crown jewels. Um, and he is a Dutch guy and he came to us and he had the exact measurements and drawings of all the little stones which are here, the rubies um, and the, what I think is something nobody knows, but the, in the top inside, there is a briolet cut of an amethyst of this big and it's round and it's just something spectacular. So I saw there's somebody from the UK uh, here and if you have the chance, and I'm not sure when they reopen due to COVID, but please go to the Tower of London and you can actually see 
the real Cullen and Diamond displays. So that is my story about one of my most favorite diamonds in the world. And we have limited time during this uh, 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 presentation. Otherwise, I could have gone on with so many more stories about the Cullen and Diamond. But I know that uh, um, there is also a few stones where people don't know a lot about. Um, yeah. So Chris, why don't you tell me something about something <laughs> colored? So, so uh, if, if I may, because um, I, 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 uh, um, I, I, I can't top that story what Mike just did. There's no chance. I mean, he, this, this, I was sticking to every word he was saying, but uh, we, we have the theme of you know, the history, uh, the title, the history, the lore, and the legend of diamonds. So I thought I'd bring in uh, two to three that are not that well known. Uh, the first one, it actually comes here from my hometown of Bavaria. Um, it is uh, next to the Hope Diamond, uh, the largest blue diamond there is. It's called the Blue Wittelsbach. It's about 25 carats, and it was in the possession of the Wittelsbach family up to 1918 when we kind of abolished royalty. If who's not familiar with the Wittelsbach family, they are the oldest uh, royal family in Europe, ruling Bavaria. Bavaria is the southern part of Germany, where you know all the beer and the lederhosen and BMWs come from. Um, so they ruled Bavaria from the 12th century up to 1918. Yeah, and um, like I said, it was about 25 carats. It was uh, at one time in the in the brooch you just saw, but it was had a nifty thing that you could take it out and put it into the crown, so the crown jewels as well. And uh, it kind of got lost after the First World War. Um, uh, it was it was it went through a lot of hands, but in 2008 it reappeared. And it was bought by Graf Diamonds, and uh, it 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 caused a big scandal of with Graf Diamonds in two ways. First of all, uh, especially here in Germany, the Bavarian government had the chance to uh, repurchase it at auction to bring this historic, his significant diamond back to Germany uh, into the crown in crown jewels collection that is still on display here in Munich. Uh, the second thing is Graf had the diamond recut, and this, you know, gave a big uproar with the historians because uh, you took something of historic importance and remodel it basically. Um, the, the result probably probably is pretty amazing, but you know it took away the historic uh, aspect of it. And you can look at this diamond as like the Hope Diamond at the Smithsonian Museum in Washington, DC. So if you're up to looking at the most important Bavarian diamond, you can just hop down to Washington once everything reopens again. And then uh, uh, one thing, especially that's on New York, in New York at display at the moment, I don't know if the Metrop is the Metropolitan Museum open, Erica, at the moment, or is it all closed? It, it is, but very limited. So okay. it's, it's, it isn't, isn't. It's invitation. You have to make appointments. Um, so you have to make a reservation beforehand. Okay. And they're only letting a certain amount of people in. Okay. So if anyone has the chance to go to the Metropolitan Museum, yeah. you are in luck because you will see dressed in green. It is the, the largest natural fancy colored green diamond in exist existence. It's either Brazilian or Indian origin. We do not know exactly. Uh, it's roughly uh, 41, eight, uh, 41 carats in size. So it's quite big as you can see here on the picture. And uh, it was purchased in 1722 by uh, King August of Saxony. So, so why, why, is it, why am I telling you about this one? Well, first of all, you know, the importance about it being the largest green diamond, but uh, it came in the news exactly one year ago. We had the the, one of the biggest diamond heists in the world, uh, the treasury chamber of the, of the kingdom of Saxony was raided. And um, the, the thing was though, that this diamond there, the, green, the dressed in green was supposed to be transported to New York, but no one knew when. So, so we got lucky because the robbers were able to obtain massive uh, uh, diamond jewelry, they, including a brooch with a 50 carat diamond, a saber wow. placed in diamonds, and all these other, uh, uh, you know, historic, uh, um, um, you know, cultural, historic uh, 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 symbols of importance. So, 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 thank you, New York. You saved the green diamond for us. You can say, and um, and like like I said, if you have the chance, hop down to Metropolitan Museum of Art and go there. And then the last one, I don't want to bore everyone with with a lot of stories about the <laughs> about. Uh, Keep going. These are great. Okay, great, right, great, thank you. The last one I want to talk about, it's called the Florentine diamond. Now the Florentine diamond, uh, no one really knows where it came from, but at one point in history, we were able to tra trace it back to about 1506. Um, it was a modified briolette cut 
of over a hundred and um, over 137 carats, fancy yellow. Yeah, so so there is only one photograph of the diamond itself, uh, but it's in black and white. And the reason why it has such an important historic importance is that it was a the guy who bought it in 1506 was the richest man in history called Jacob Fugger. Yeah, so everyone sitting here probably never heard of this guy before, but um, the, the reason why he comes up or his importance for the diamond world as well is uh, he was not just the inventor of the newspaper and of a modern business. It, like I said, he was the richest person in history. You take Andrew Carnegie, Rockefeller, Bill Gates, Warren Buffett, you take all their, their, um, their wealth combined, you're not even close to where this man was and almost no one knows about it. And he had trading posts in all of Europe. So in London, Lisbon, um, Amsterdam, Antwerp. And in Antwerp, uh, he would uh, do trade with India. So he would be importing diamonds into Europe, having them cut there and then distributing through all the royal houses. So, so anyone who's interested in, in diamonds and the history of how they came to the royal houses, uh, I did have a picture here before of him, but it kind of got lost in my pile. But it is uh, Jacob Fugger. And uh, Jacob has the by name, Jacob the Rich. So if your by name is Jacob the Rich, you know you really had money and wealth during that time. <laughs> and history, you can say. Is that other large blue for us, just like the Hope? Sorry, what? The other blue that you had just showed us, the blue diamond. Is that for diamond? Sorry, your your connection was breaking away. Does it fluoresce the same way as the Hope Diamond? That that I do not know. Uh, not that many details are known about it. It's just that uh, that it's you know it was recut in the whole history. It even even belonged to the uh, the Emir of Qatar for 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 a brief time and everything. Wow. And uh, and uh, like I said, it, it was a big bummer for. For Germany, because we did have the chance of regaining it at auction, and the Bavarian government failed, uh, like just you know a couple thousand dollars in bids to to secure it, you can say. <laughs> so otherwise, it would have returned home. But uh, now now it's in Washington. So you guys, uh, whoever's in the U.S. has uh, has a good access to it, you can say. And Brina, do you have a favorite legend or tale surrounding a diamond? Sorry, I can't hear you. Who are you um, addressing the question to? Yeah, to you. Do you oh. have a favorite? Do you have a favorite diamond tale or legend? Uh, so you know there are a lot uh, that I did enjoy, but um, off lately when I was reading the Cartiers, uh, there was one story that I found really interesting when. Um, when I was reading about uh, how the Maharaja of Patiala's uh, necklace was commissioned by them. And uh, so one of the interesting facts was um, Mufat, who is uh, who used to be uh, the Cartier Paris salesperson at that point in time. In 1928, he attended the Maharaja and uh, the Maharaja gave him a box full of jewels and diamonds and emeralds and rubies. And out of respect, Mufat actually started making a whole list. He was totally in awe of all the gemstones and the diamonds. And he started making a list out of them. And the Maharaja goes like, what are you doing? And uh, he said, I'm penning down all the jewelry and the diamonds that you are um, you know, telling me to take. And he said, no, just, just take it all. And like, that's the trust Maharaja Bhupinder Singh of Patiala had in the brand Cartier that uh, he said, just take everything and all I need is modern jewelry for me and my family. And uh, that, that was, I mean, that, that trust in the brand was such a fascinating story to, um, you know, to read about, which eventually when we see the, the necklace, it had 2,930 diamonds, which was over 1,000 carats. And the centerpiece was almost... 234 uh, six carats, which was a De Beers diamond. So, which, which happens to be almost a golf ball size. That was, I think, one of the uh, tales that I really enjoyed a lot. And uh, that book is a must read, I must say that. But in fact, I think Mike also has a story to share for that because they also have commissioned few pieces for the Maharaja Patiala. 
Well, actually, you know, thanks for stating that. But I was looking, and we have, um, like, we have a whole wall of uh, the of royal families behind uh, myself, um, including uh, Queen Elizabeth with Granny's chips. And I was looking because I know that before the Second World War, we we have received the Maharaja of Pachala here um, in our office, uh, and I also don't know where the picture is but it is not in this office. And uh, in, if I would take the computer down to the basement where we have our auditorium, then uh, uh, I would not have connection. Um, so unfortunately, I was not able to show that. But when you started to say that, you know, you, you're, you had such an amazing story about, the, uh, about this necklace, I was like, that is such a great connection that we have because uh, he actually, he has been in this office maybe even in this chair, but in this office where I'm right now, because it's the same office that we kept in the same state for the last 120 years. So uh, oh. yeah, it's, uh, it's amazing. That is, I mean, that is great to have something like that and to actually see it and to have the traceability as well. It's, it's so, uh, these stories I think are, they connect you back to this material. It's not just a diamond. It's not just a rock. It, it connects you. It's wonderful. So what do you guys all think is so alluring? I mean, from the first engagement ring to having diamonds be around and, you know, forever. What do you, what do you think it is that has captivated historians and, you know, like that. Anyone can answer the question. Chris, Chris, would you like to go first? I'll do it. I'll do it very short. I think I think it's the natural rareness of diamonds, you know, that they're now mass produced product and every diamond is unique. And especially when it comes to jewelry, it turns into our personal history. You know, so 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 no matter, you know, you can you can you can buy a smartphone and it will be it will be over in two to three years. But that that diamond engagement ring, that necklace you gave to your wife for the first of your for the birth of your first child, you're going to pass that on throughout the family. And it comes to personal history. And I think uh, that's how jewelry and diamonds uh, make it so alluring or are the alluring factor of the whole thing. And I, I hope I hope we'll all be able to tell this story in the future better than the jewelry industry, and the, especially the diamond industry, is doing at the moment. <laughs> yeah. Well, you know, Mike, what I, do you think about you? I mean, you know, I want to look jump what you have there. created. Um, you know, there's uh, uh, I'm the sixth generation of uh, our family business, and in history we have cut. Well, some of the most important diamonds in the world, um, and uh, uh, so just some. It, no, it, you know, it, it is more that that emotional connection with the product. I I, I I've done some uh, some presentations uh, in the past for consumer uh, um, uh, shows, and and I had to compete with bigger brands, um, and I was on on stage, and and when. Uh, I started, the first thing I said, I said was, we are illusionists. And people were wondering, what is he talking about? Because I think the most beautiful aspect of a diamond, going from rough to polished, and then getting that, if, if you have a rough diamond, I think a rough is something spectacular because you never know what's What's, what comes out, uh, even in color, there, there's, there are so many things that you can do or improve or, or excite you. And then when you come to that emotional connection of the polished product that goes to the end consumer, um, and, and I, I, I totally agree with Chris, it's the connection that you make towards every single, there's no other product in the world that I know of that is given on any occasion where there is joy in life, only. It's the most That's beautiful really. moments in life are celebrated with a diamond. And when I was talking uh, lately uh, uh, the, with the young Diamanteers, we had a panel discussion uh, uh, with Diamonds to Good. 
and um, uh, Christina uh, Gambele uh, of uh, Greenwich Street Jewelers uh, was there. Mm -hmm. but, you know, people within and over the past six, nine months during this dramatic COVID period that we're all facing, um, they actually really understand that when you now buy something with such an emotional value, you will keep it for so many generations and it's it is not an instant gratification of a phone or any other type of luxury product. No, diamonds are so unique and rare. Um, and we can see it again now, you know, the, the, the Argyle mine, pink diamonds, it's closed. What's next? Yeah. So, um, yeah, I think the connection, the emotional connection that diamond bring to the most beautiful moment in people's life is, is what amazed me most. Yeah, I mean, that mine wasn't closed six days ago, five days ago, within the last 10 days, I think. But yeah, I mean, you, some of these mines can't produce the same way they once were, and these large diamonds are, are when they're found, it's, it's incredible what's created and what's cut. I mean, look at those cuts and the shapes that we're creating from what happened 100 years ago to what we're doing with them today. Beautiful. Karina, what do you, what do you? Sorry, I want to just ahead, to jump in there because the, the thing that you said about the large diamonds. Yeah, so so um, we have now uh, obviously the record with the largest rough diamond ever found. But what is interesting um, is, is the technolog technological improvement that we have in the last two to five years we have found more large stones above 100 carats than we found in the last 100 years. Um, wow. And that's only by uh, the improvement of technology. Um, and also, uh, it, it therefore also becomes much more focused and much easier to focus on the traceability of the product. Interesting. Interesting. Sorry to go and jump. In there, just uh... no, but that that actually will lead into another question. So I do wanna I do wanna hold off because I want I would love to hear from Karina and your and your opinion on this because you're so influential in India in regards to the jewelry and gem industry and the influence you have. What do you what do you feel is from your perspective? What do you feel is so worrying about it? So, so, you know, uh, last year in 2019, um, as Chris mentioned, we traveled to South Africa together to the Venetia mines. Wow. Experiencing that entire process of what a diamond goes through right from the mining to a finished diamond, to a cut diamond. That I think that experience in itself is so fascinating. And it, it made me feel so proud that I can actually wear something which takes millions of years to form. That story in itself is so alluring. And I think if that is conveyed properly, as, as we talk about the black, uh, blockchain technology, that is conveyed properly to the consumer, that feeling, that emotion in itself is just, is just uh, you know, it, it, it brings emotion. It, it, it's very uh, fascinating to go through that entire journey. So I think that that yeah. is really very important and also just like Mike said, that every occasion, you know, it's it's symbolized in a form of gifting a diamond or any form of jewelry. So it's that joy, you know, it's, it, we say that a diamond is a girl's best friend. It That instant spark in our eyes when we see a diamond. So I think yeah. it's probably just that. It's, that's absolutely, it's absolutely true. I think, you know, we're always talking about color because of how different it is and, and what's happening in society and the world. But we always come back to diamonds. It, it's always it's the full circle. Yeah. And yeah. Knowing knowing these little things, knowing the history, it's you know, it's a diamond. <laughs> I think that's, that's what it is. It's a diamond. And as long as it's, you know, beautifully cut and set, you know, magnificently it can survive a lot and many generations as well. Um, so, so 
Sabrina, for you, um, what can you tell us about diamonds today uh, from the trend of what you're seeing as well as how it's, what the trend is in bridal? So I would say that uh, the trends more than diamonds in jewelry um, with the current given situation, people are now moving more towards meaningful jewelry. So they have started valuing relationships and emotions much more in the last eight months or almost a year of this entire pandemic. Mm -hmm. So uh, uh, especially in India, I mean, where we have those Indian big fat weddings, people are now opting for intimate weddings and they have sort of revised their wedding budgets and working more towards purchasing jewelry. So that's a positive shift to actually see. Wow. And uh, with, with Diwali just having, you know, gone in the past two, three days, the markets have actually uh, have seen a very positive sign in the last one week. People have done sales what more than what they did in the last festival last year. So it's, it's a great comeback for jewelers in India to see that entire shift in the last one week. And uh, wow. so, I mean, similarly, engagement rings and bridal rings are always going to be popular because during the pandemic, yes, there were no weddings, but eventually they will happen. Weddings have started to already, you know, they've already started to take place in India and people... In the next six months, most of the venues are already sold out because people are just every everyone's wedding who had to be uh, who, which had to happen during the pandemic is happening now. So, yeah. I think there'll be a great shift to see that. I I would just say it like meaningful jewelry. A lot of people are also shifting towards jewelry which uh, has some sort of uh, you know spiritual uh, symbol uh, uh, spiritual significance. It could mm -hmm. be charms, it could be talismans, it could be evil eye, it could be any form of jewelry that, you know, um, gives them that emotional connect to it. So that's also one thing that uh, I think I would say where the trends are leading towards. It's, it's interesting the points you bring up, especially with what's happening in the pandemic. I think we've all seen, I think a lot of us have seen shifts where people are are either they weren't spending in the beginning and now they're spending, but they're not just buying, they're not just buying five things like they were doing you know, in the right. early 2000s. They're buying one, they're buying one or two items and it is longevity, yeah. it's, but it's still larger pieces. It's that secure feeling that I think a lot of people are doing where like the one carat, you know, G, G, H, up by one was very popular. We're now seeing that those stones are getting larger. People are investing slightly different into different shapes. So it's, in, it's wonderful that we're seeing that across the whole globe, especially in India, where this pandemic has actually really affected the country. So that's actually good to hear, I mean, from, from a U.S. perspective. Chris, Mike, are you seeing that as well? In yes, for sure. Um, well, actually... What we see is, um, first of all, when, when, when the first lockdown uh, uh, was there um, and, and markets opened up, um, we've seen an, 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 an incredible increase in, in sales and engagement rings. And first of all, the first part was postponed purchases because March, March April, May normally is engagement season. Um, so uh, uh, when in June or July uh, markets opened up, it went through the roof. Um, and secondly, the budgets were larger, mostly because people uh, were staying at home and couldn't spend any money at all. And in, in Europe, they were definitely not allowed to travel. Um, so uh, their holiday allowance and, uh, and additional income uh, went uh, uh, to higher ticket prices. Um, overall, we see we have seen, especially in the June July uh, period, that that retailers really were busier, more busy than them during Christmas last year. Um, uh, so that was good. What I see in trends is is um, authenticity makes uh, uh, is an authentic story towards the product. Um, uh, luckily, I have one, so I can I can I can share uh, I, I know that that 
when when we start selling product, um, uh, you know, we we sell four patented diamond cuts, um, and and we only do that because we 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 think we cut that in the DNA is we cut for beauty and not for yield, and therefore we try to um, not over facet the cut, but but really add value and add beauty. Uh, we see. I think what a lot of people, retailers are experiencing is ovals are incredibly uh, um, uh, successful now. Mm -hmm. But lately I also see a trend towards just more elongated stones. Um, and it's also because it has a bigger look. Um, mm -hmm. And uh, so the funny thing is if we take the Kerlin uh, uh, collection again, um, then uh, it, you see that this is the culinary number two, which is actually 317 carats in real life. But um, when we started to design our own color, uh, uh, new Royal Asher cushion, which was about three, four years ago, we we cut it exactly as a copy of the culinary number three, which is um, a square one. Um, and now we have requests, okay, it's such a beautiful cut, can you also make it elongated? Um, so, so I see that there's a trend of shift towards shape, um, and uh, and and the more feminine shapes, uh, more the ovals are very, doing very well. Elongated cushions are doing very well. Um, so uh, that's just definitely a trend that we see today happening. Yeah, those are I mean some of those new cuts that you that you've recently come out with are beautiful. I mean, they are. So we briefly mentioned this earlier about the traceability of diamonds, and I think it's something that is, um, is always important to discuss because as more people, especially in the United States, are reading articles and doing their own research from you know outside the industry's perspective, we want to know where our material is coming from. We want to know who's cutting it. We want to know that whole blockchain black and white. We want it in front of us. Do you, what do you, do, what is the responsibility that we have? What do you guys see is actually happening in the, in the industry that is bringing these things to be clearer? Um, and the traceability, the sustainability, the responsibility, we're throwing these words out left and right. So do you, what, do you, what do you really think is the bottom of ensuring that this continues into a positive direction of what the diamond industry is and make it where people feel like this is, this is good, I'm not wearing quote unquote, a blood diamond on my hand. Well, Chris, would you I like to go about, for a mic? Uh, it, well, if you touch on a conflict diamonds, which I think is a better terminology, um, I think I, I, I would be able to start with um, some of the thought process which is going on. My father uh, retired March 2nd this year after 50 years uh, uh, in our business. Um, and he uh, became the president of the World Diamond Council. And the World Diamond Council is the, uh, I think, the highest political body within our industry, dealing with NGOs, dealing with governments, dealing with the mining companies, to uh, since 2000, uh, already working on the Kimberley process um, and making sure that, I'm not sure if people know within our industry, but the diamond, a diamond, is the second best self-regulated um, uh, material commodity in the world. Uranium is the number one. Um, and since we started, and since actually the, 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 the war in Sierra Leone was over, um, we have been able to guarantee our whole industry and 99.999% of our entire value chain to be conflict-free. Um, and, and that is something which is a remarkable uh, uh, achievement of our industry. And therefore, I also say that the, the movie Blood Diamonds was a blessing in the sky for our industry, understanding the importance of transparency, understanding the importance of traceability, not even at that moment, 
but really looking at social responsibility. Mm -hmm. And the most important part in the vision of uh, the Kimberley process and the World Diamond Council together is that we are trying now to put more effort into human rights. Um, and, and what we think is so valuable today is that when you look at um, the different companies, the different mining companies, is we are all giving back to community and we are all working so uh, proud and hard to show that and be as transparent as possible to show that where is the, which mine is the diamond coming from? Eventually, who is polishing the stone? Who, which people in the entire value chain are dependent and how many people in their villages, cities and surroundings are dependent on our industry? And therefore this traceability, um, social responsibility and, and ethics is so incredibly important. And I think it's even more important for our industry and at this moment than for the consumer because there are not so many consumers who walk into a store and say can you tell me where did it come from who polished it did he uh, get did he get treated well they are bu buying an emotional product for this this once in a lifetime experience i'm gonna get engaged i i, I really yes of course there are a few people who are interested and i think it's an obligation of our industry to make sure that we have full transparency um, and uh, and that we focus and we see so many great initiatives from Alrosa, from the Bears, uh, from the Minion um, that that we really can show where um, where where diamonds are coming from and 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 how uh, the whole journey of the stone from mine to the engagement ring uh, is focused. I also believe there's a lot of work to do um, uh, on these specific topics. But uh, I think our industry has been doing an incredible job to, to get where we are today. So um, that was my, from my perspective. Chris, you want to add something? Not much to add after that. <laughs> you, you gave it all, but, uh, but I, just to sum it up, you know, uh, like Mike said, the diamond is the only commodity that's really traceable after uranium. If you look at um, mm -hmm. you know, chocolate or, or oil or you know, wherever, whatever else we consume in our daily life, um, people don't really care that much where it comes from in, in that sense. Um, so sometimes even overhyped of the diamond traceability because we do have the Kimberley process and everything in place. So, so, so I think uh, a lot comes down also to trust. Yeah, uh, people usually don't buy a, a diamond from your store or from my store. They buy it from the person from Chris. If Chris mm -hmm. says, you know what, I did my homework, I checked out where, where is it coming from, I know the sources, I know the supplier, I sell, for instance, uh, Mike Asher, uh, we, we do business together, so I sell his diamonds as well. I can always tell the people, I know him personally, I know that he's a good guy, I know that, we're, that he sources responsibly, and I think that's also a, a big factor, is not just you know saying, here's the papers, but here's also the trust to the person who's selling this emotional product, you can say. Um, Prina, anything you would like to add? Uh, yeah, so I think when it comes to traceability, uh, Mike has pretty much said everything. But what I would also like to add is that I think it, it also matters a lot with one's attitude. I mean, until a few years ago, people were not even bothered about having certificates. It, it was a process that consumers started understanding the whole process of having a certificate and now they find it important to know if it's a GI certified IGI or any other. Similarly, I think even the blockchain technology, unless the entire ecosystem of this chain uh, gives it importance, the consumer is not going to value it. So it's going to be, it, it will take a few years, but I think it's more to do with the entire system that we need to change our attitude towards it. Mm -hmm. I think with, when it comes to sustainability and responsibility, I see that some of the giant players are already taking measures towards, uh, for example, if I would say somebody like Saris or Hare Krishna, which are one of the major exporters in India, they are already working towards system where they they have power cut down in their um, in their factories. Uh, they have uh, you know they've merged uh, departments together where they think that they could save electricity or any sort of uh, you know carbon emission uh, machines mm -hmm. and uh, similarly I think also um, 
just can't support. Yeah. So uh, even there's this uh, brand called Brilliant Earth, which if you see their website, you can actually see that they uh, they mention the origin of the diamonds there. They also have a section where they've mentioned about recycled diamonds. So where diamonds have already been purchased by consumers and can be resold into, into another piece of jewelry. So I think those are the measures people are already taking, but it's, it's more to do with the consumers, how we educate them. Yes, Mike. <laughs> I want to add one more thing. Um, while we are talking about um, social responsibility, um, uh, and is, I, I'm going to jump in here on a total different topic, but I think it fits it perfectly. Um, uh, when uh, Prerna and, uh, and Chris last year visited the Phoenician mine, um, they also visited um, the Renaissance School, uh, which is uh, in a very small village, uh, uh, but dependent on the diamond industry. Uh, and they noticed that, uh, um, this was with a group of young diamantists, they noticed that there are uh, this is a school with about 2,400 uh, students, um, mostly built by the beers, um, but the, the school itself does not have a kitchen nor a library. Um, and, and there are children who are going to school there between the age of 12 and 16, uh, which is a critical age in your life, on one meal a day. So I'm just going to put on the chat for everyone to see. If you go to our Young Diamanteras website, ydts.org, you can see the project that we have supported um, and, uh, um, and also obviously donate uh, uh, for this incredible project because it is so close to our heart and it fits our social responsibility and our purpose um, so well um, that I, I wanted to, uh, to, to take a moment and drop it in right here because uh, it's such an important part of what brings Chris, Prana, and myself together um, next to uh, having fun and uh, uh, seeing each other at the, uh, at, show, at, this, at the conferences and shows, but something that is so true to our heart and it fits this ethical and social responsibility part uh, perfectly. Absolutely. I mean, we know that there's in this color, while there's definitely organizations that are trying to do the same thing, but to know that there's organizations doing it from a diamond perspective, it, it softens everything. It makes it easier to understand what's actually happening because I think so many of our clients come to us with, they've over-educated themselves and they freak themselves out and they have all these questions and you're trying to bring them back down to reality and saying, hey, these are, no, what happened 100 years ago is not happening today and things have really changed. So um, we are just getting close to the end, but I want to give you guys all some time. Was there any other stories that you guys wanted to share? Anything else that you love that you have, wish you got to talk a little bit more about? I want to open it up to the three of you before I let everybody ask some questions because I know Chris, there's a million and one diamonds that you have the uh, extreme passion about. And so that I would love to give you guys time if there's anything else you want to talk about. There are, but you know, like I said, I don't want to bore anyone with too much history. Um, I hope I hope uh, everyone here enjoyed the presentation. It was it was fantastic being here. I I, I always love listening to Mike and Prenna what they have the input, and uh, especially uh, the work of the WGA in general. I know I know the, uh, the LA chapter very good because I do a lot of business in Los Angeles as well. Not so much in New York, but I hope to change that in the future. And uh, the WGA is doing a fantastic work as well. So so it was uh, f thank you so much for having us here today, Erica, uh, and I hope everyone here enjoyed it as well. Thank you very much for having, for all of you for being part of this and for everybody who has logged in. I am going to um, open everything up in case people have questions. Um, we heard some wonderful stories, so I want everyone to have an opportunity. You all can unmute yourselves if you have questions. Um, so, should be able to unmute yourselves now. And if you have any questions, please 
feel free to um, ask away. I did know there were a few questions that have popped up throughout this, and I know, Chris, you did answer, but are there any books that are your favorites that either talk about the history or diamond cutting that you recommend? Um, there, there sadly aren't too many books out there. Um, so, so, so you, you, you kind of always can find a tidbit here or a tidbit there about historical persons if there is a diamond relation. So uh, an American historian recently wrote the book. It's called The, the Richest Man Who Ever Lived or The Richest Man in History uh, uh, about Jacob Fugger I was talking about before. And there is a, a good chapter about how the diamond trade was, was done in Europe uh, during his time period and how he was an active uh, player. So if you're interested in history about the, the 15th, 16th century, about how diamonds you know, came to the royal houses and stuff like that, and uh, it's, a, it's, it's very light reading. So you know, it was not, 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 he was actually not a historian. He was a, he's a financial advisor on Wall Street. So he wrote, he wrote the book in a good uh, readable manner. So it's not going to go, you know, you don't have to be a history uh, 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 student to, to understand what he's uh, who is writing about. That would be one. And the other one I already wrote in the chat, it's called Facets of Mankind. It, uh, it was uh, released uh, by um, someone in the World Federation of Diamond Bourses. He researched his book over a couple of years. And I think it's a good English reference uh, to, to, uh, to go through all the historic diamonds uh, if, you, if your native language is English, for instance. Wonderful. Um, any other questions? No. Okay. We were so well, good, we covered it all. Yeah, fantastic. Thank you. <laughs> Chris covered it all. So thank you, Mike. Thank you, Chris. Thank you, Karina. I, this was wonderful. I'm so happy we were all able to do this. And stay safe. Uh, and um, I hope everything keeps going in a positive direction for all of you. Thank you very much from WJA and myself for doing this. And um, have a wonderful day, everybody. Thank you. Thank you very Thank much. You so much. Bye. It was fun. Thank, Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. Care. Thank you.